Hello, viewers, and welcome back to Sahara TV. With me is Raymond Lada, a revolutionary intellectual, political economist, and contributor to Revolution Newspaper. He has written and lectured extensively on issues of world economics and politics, the environment, and the history and experience of the socialist revolutions in both the Soviet Union from 1917 to 1956 and China 1949 to 1976. Rada takes his theoretical foundation from Bob Akian's new synthesis of communism. Lada's books include America in Decline and Maoist Economics and the Revolutionary Road to Communism. His articles have appeared in international publications like Race and Class in the UK and Economic and Political Weekly in India. Mr. Lada, thank you so much for being with us here on Sahara TV. Well, thanks for having me on. Today, viewers, the actual question is turmoil in Egypt, and we're basing it off of an article that Mr. Lada wrote um, recently on the myth of people power, given the crisis that has unfolded since the ouster of Morsi in Egypt, and even going beyond that to say that the real problem lies with the foundation and roots of the economic and political systems that underlie the Egyptian nation. Thank you again for being with us here at Sahara TV. So to start out, I'd like to ask you this myth of people power and what we've seen since the ouster of Morsi and this idea that at least it appeared on the surface that the military was the so-called stewards of democracy. What exactly happened? And, and now we see that they're almost oppressing completely the Muslim Brotherhood. There have been numerous individuals killed. So was there a misrepresentation or were the people fooled or was there miscalculation on their part? What are your thoughts on that? Well, you're posing very critical questions. I mean, first of all, the situation in Egypt right now is that you know society is on a very bad downward spiral for the people. Society is being polarized around two reactionary and unacceptable alternatives, Islamic fundamentalism on the one hand, and the military, the Egyptian military, which represents the interest of US imperialism, of Western imperialism on the other. So we're seeing this kind of you know, very downward spiral. We're seeing an incredible massacre that's been launched against, you know, the Islamic Brotherhood and its followers. And as I said, society is being polarized in this very, very bad way, you know, with large sections of people who had been involved in the 2011 uprising that ousted Mubarak, Hosni Mubarak, you know, the despotic leader of that society, right, who had been installed with the backing of U.S. imperialism, right? right? We saw a mass movement, you know, to oust him. Uh, but that was a big revolt, a big uprising, but a revolution did not take place. And this is very essential to understanding events in, you know, Egypt. That is, you know, you have a hated despot that was driven from power, but the same oppressive forces, you know, that rule over Egyptian society, the same economic, you know, relations that result in the incredible poverty and the dislocation in Egyptian society, and the same state, the same neo-colonial state that has been an instrument of Western domination and penetration, not just into Egypt, but actually serving the larger interest of imperialism, U.S. imperialism in particular in the Middle East, you know, remained in power. Right. So what you have was the ouster of a of a, of, a, of a hated representative of the old order, but the old order itself was still there. Was still there. Right. The military, and this is very critical, the military is the bulwark of the old order. Yeah, I'd like to actually take a moment and um, have you explain more. I think a lot of people, I mean, uh, don't really understand or, or, or fail to see how entrenched the military. The military almost, maybe it's not unique only to Egypt, but the situation that the military has set up in Egypt over the years is very unique in its own right. The fact that they are almost like a second economy within the country. I think it's, it's remarkable that they control like 40% of economic, they have businesses, they have, it's not just the fact that they're there defending the state. They have so many entrenched interests in the state, including economic and power and all these different things that it's, it's almost like they're a shadow government, so to speak, of even regardless of whether Morsi Mubarak or otherwise is in power. And I don't know if that was really understood, it seems, the first time around. Yeah, let me say two things about this. One, we have to understand that the military, as I said, is the key instrument of state power, mm -hmm. of, the, of the institutions uh, and modes of governance in Egyptian society, but anywhere in the world. Right. In the US, we have you know, an imperialist system. The military is the key link. In other words, no ruling class can stay in power. And we live in a world that's divided into classes, right? right? And we live in a world in which governments, regimes, the state, right, reflects and enforces the interests of these dominant 
ruling classes, their privileged position in society. These are exploiting classes. Now, the situation in Egypt is that you have uh, a dictatorship that exists. It's a dictatorship of the exploiting you know, classes in you know, the landed, you know, the privileged landed elites, the uh, capitalist forces that have developed in a very subordinate relationship to Western imperialism. And the military serves two key functions. One, it's the guarantor of Western imperialist mm. interests. Now look, mm. the Egyptian military is the largest recipient, the Egyptian state is the largest recipient of US military aid in the world, the second largest recipient of US military in the world next to Israel. Right. And that tells you something right there. And that military has played a very vital role since 1969, since 1979, when the uh, Egypt-Israel so-called peace accord was signed. And it has played this vital role in guaranteeing the existence of this settler colonial mm -hmm. um, state in Israel. The U.S. has enjoyed overflight privileges, you know, through Egyptian airspace. Right. Uh, in, in waging you know, the Gulf War number one, in waging its wars of terror against the peoples of Afghanistan and elsewhere. The Suez Canal right. is a key link in, 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 in this whole arrangement of the U.S. dominance of the world economy. U.S. naval ships pass through that canal. Uh, oil passes through that canal. So you see that this Egyptian state, this neo-colonial state, serves two functions. One, to hold down the Egyptian people, and two, to, uh, to, to serve the larger strategic and geopolitical interests of US imperialism mm -hmm. in that part of the world. Now, we get to the ouster of Mubarak, the military is still the key instrumentality right. you know, of the state, and US imperialism was seeking to sort of cut its losses and to sort of maximize its gains in a situation where its trusted you know, handmaiden Mubarak was no longer there. So their key leverage was through the military, but the old order had sort of cracked. So it was looking, the US was looking, you know, to restabilize and the military was the key link. And then the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, was actually part of kind of putting the, you know, putting Humpty Dumpty back together, the, right. you know, the, 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 the neo-colonial state. But then contradictions arose between the Brotherhood, which represents, as I said, an oppressive reactionary theocratic force, and the military, which represents, you know, the, 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 the larger strategic interest mm -hmm. of U.S. imperialism. And then there were popular protests right. that were mounting. And this brings me back to your question about what about people's attitude towards the military? And I have to say that it is absolutely shameful that people that rose up in February 2011, you know, to drive out this oppressive regime began to delude themselves into thinking that somehow this military was an instrument of the popular will, right. which it never like, was and is not today. Right. And now people are seeing the consequences of that in this incredible bloodbath that's taking place. Thousands of people injured and killed and arrested. And meanwhile, the basic, most fundamental needs of the Egyptian people are not no, being met. Being, right. So how do you think that happened, this delusion, where people just looking for something that like they thought was going to happen or they were just... I mean, how did they make the separation between Mubarak and the military so cleanly that some, like you say, like they delude themselves into believe that even though the military had been the key to behind Mubarak's regime and others, and it still is the key to the state, like how was that separation made that suddenly Mubarak is gone, but not much else in the regime, including the military, had, had fallen by the way, so they were still there. Right. still set up like how, how do they do that well as i said this was you know both a product of two things one people do not have you know real revolutionary leadership right. in this okay. in this movement and one of the things that i address in you know my talk and in my articles by the way which are available at revcom r-e-v-c-o-m dot u-s mm -hmm. the article and the video of a talk that i gave that expands on the themes that we're talking right. about that what's missing in this is what you have these two reactionary forces and by far the, the 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 greater danger and the more you know oppressive is u.s is, is is u.s imperialism and western imperialism but the islamic forces the fundamentalist forces you know don't represent any way out any alternative you know to the situation in society that is the exploitation of people the right. dominance of the economy and social life by western imperialism the incredible suffering of women the support Coordination and degradation of women in every sphere of Egyptian society. None of these forces 
can provide an alternative, you know, to the destruction of the environment in Egypt. You know, what's happening to the Nile River, water levels declining, the degradation uh, of the soil fertility, the loss of land to desertification, and, and, and this reckless development that's taking place, commercial and industrial development. You know, Egypt imports you know, more wheat than any country right. in the world. And yet it could develop a self-sustaining agriculture. All of this is a reflection that there that these two reactionary forces do not represent a way out. And what's missing is a real revolutionary alternative, a revolutionary communist alternative that can help people understand what is actually going on, who these different social and political forces represent. And in the case of the 20th century, we saw puppets overthrown by the masses, right. you know, in the Philippines, Marcos, in Indonesia, Suharto, right? We saw the Shah of Iran, right. you know, over the, but in those instances, imperialism was able to regroup. Mm -hmm. What was missing was that there was not a revolutionary communist leadership that could help people see and understand what these different social forces represent and to actually right. mobilize and organize and help people raise their sights to the possibility of a whole other world. And I do want to say that in the case of so of Russia in 1917, there an autocrat was overthrown, the right. Tsar and then the Kerensky government. But you had a Bolshevik party, a com communist, that was able to take that situation, raise people's sights, raise people's understanding, and lead people to make a revolution that actually transforms society and the world. Now that revolution, you know, was reversed, it doesn't exist, but there is this crucial lesson. And in Egypt today, any revolution has to make a twofold rupture. One, with imperialism, right. and two, with the old ways, with tradition, with custom, with all the social and economic relations that enslave people. You need a social revolution on the one hand that transforms everything, mm -hmm. and very centrally, the subordination of women, and you need a revolution that breaks out of the vice grip of the imperialist world economy. So how would that happen? I mean, that would be an entire disruption of the system, given that the, I mean, especially in the economic and political level, like how does that come about? Like a party sort of takes control, but then in the interim, how does it ensure, like right now, the people's needs aren't being met. The economy in Egypt is obviously having a lot of issues. How, if you're going to disrupt an entire system, do you try to meet, is there a portion where you just are assured that there's a gap and people's needs may not be met until we reach this point? Or is there a way that a, like you said, like a socialist party comes in and has already fundamental plans for turning at least some things around faster to, to meet base, because still people's basic necessities while this is going on obviously needs to well, be. Well, look, I, I, you know, you're, you're raising very important questions about revolutionary strategy. Okay, on the one hand, this system, you know, this old economic, social, and political order, it is decrepit. It cannot meet the basic needs right. of the people, right? You have, as I said, you know, a situation where 40% of the population lives at or near, or at or, you know, near, at, or below the poverty level. 40% exactly. of the population in Egypt, that's living on less than $2 a day. Right. Now, whether you're going for IMF, International Monetary Fund, Western style modernization, or if the, the theocratic, you know, uh, agenda of the, of, the, of the Islamic fundamentalist takes so none of that is gonna change this fundamental situation. Right. It's both, you know, the, the Islamic fundamentalists are still beholden to the world imperialist economy. Right, there's Their the economics. Morsi was a, negotiating with the IMF. Right, the economics never right. changed. And just... the masses are not, their problems, and broader sections of people, the intellectuals and the artists and the engineers, look, for, there's a 30% unemployment rate among university mm -hmm. graduates. So the short answer is that, not, that the meet, needs of the people cannot be met. And okay. then right. there's the question, of how do you build a revolutionary movement? And here, I do want to call people's attention to this very important work, Communism, the Beginning of a New Stage, a manifesto from the Revolutionary Communist Party. Now this actually etches out, you know, the framework, the theoretical framework for initiating this new stage mm. of communist revolution. And this is based on Bob Avakian's New Synthesis of Communism. And there are big strategic questions about building this movement for revolution. And what has to happen right now in Egypt is the development of a pole, a revolutionary communist force that's struggling in the streets right. and struggling with people's minds, with their understanding and their thinking and raising people's sights to the real alternative, a, 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 a radically emancipatory world. And that's what's required. And doing that is full of challenges and difficulties, right? right. right? We're, not, you know, we're not talking about something that's gonna happen overnight, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, 
This was a situation that we saw back in February where a regime that was considered impregnable, the Mubarak regime. Right, actually you know, fell. Fell, yeah. you know, it, it, it imploded. But it was the masses going into the streets. And you saw a small minority of people, especially the youth, that played a catalytic role mm -hmm. in sort of, you know, changing the terms in society. What we need in Egypt, what's the, what humanity needs throughout the world, is a revolutionary communist force that can actually chart the way forward to make the kind of thoroughgoing revolution that I'm talking about. And right. that requires, you know, political organization, requires waging big ideological struggle in right. society around religion, around the subordination of women, mm -hmm. right? Around the, the myth, as I said, of, 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 of people, people power right. and what in fact the real power relations are in that society. And there is no enlightened capitalism, a progressive capitalism that, to, to speak to your question, can meet the needs of the people. Right. There is no humanistic religion, you know, a new variant of Christianity or Islam. And let's not forget, Islam means submission. It means to submit. There is no enlightened humanistic religion that is not based on domination, hierarchy, and the subordination of women. So you need a revolutionary communist movement that's, as I said, struggling in the streets, struggling with people's understanding, mm -hmm. and bringing forward a core of people you know, that can actually influence large sections of the right. population. Now, going forward, I mean, given these challenges and the huge things, and, and what's going on on the ground in Egypt now, what do you, do you see any, where do you see this going? Or maybe not the total end game, but what do you see the future? I mean, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, is there still possibility for some, maybe not a full revolution, but some movement toward that? Or do you think? Well, I think it's a, you know, as, as, as I said, the situation right now, is very unfavorable. It's not. It's not a situation that cannot change and yeah. cannot be transformed. But that's going to require the kind of analysis and understanding, you know, of the sort that I've been you right. know, been laying out, and requires people in Egypt really taking up, you know, this new vision, this re envisioned communism that Avakian has brought forward, and forging this real game-changing. What we need is a game-changing alternative, which is, as I said, a, 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 another way, not the imperialists and not the Islamic fundamentalists, right. but this revolutionary communist alternative. Right now, you know, the situation, as I said, is full of very negative features, mm -hmm. right? The bloodbath and the fact that people are rallying behind the military yeah. or behind the Islamic fundamentalists. You know, so this is a, a very challenging situation that needs to be transformed. But it is something that can be transformed in the way, you know, when this, you know, takes hold in the way that I'm, you know, that I'm describing. But I do want to emphasize that U.S. imperialism has blood on its hands, mm -hmm. that the tanks rolling through or Cairo, you know, are tanks that are very much bound up with U.S. military aid. The U.S. supported that coup mm -hmm. against Morsi and actually played a decisive role both openly and behind the scenes to bring down that regime. It continued after that coup. To, to, to funnel military and economic aid. And after the massacre of the forces you know, who support the, 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 the Muslim Brotherhood, I, I meant to say the Muslim Brotherhood, not the Islamic mm -hmm. Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood, which is Islamic fundamentalism. But the US continued to support the military in power you know, as, it was, you know, as it was carrying out this, this, this slaughter. So this is something that needs to be condemned. And people in Egypt, those who had previously saw the military and deluding themselves into seeing the military as a mm -hmm. positive force, need to come to grips with this delusion and this self-delusion and to condemn that massacre and to actively oppose it. And if people who really hunger for liberation are serious about that, then they need to be taking up this re-envisioned communism that I'm talking about and for this to become a material and ideological force in society. All right. Well, thank you very much for being with us here today and for speaking on this very uh, important issue as it continues um, in Egypt. Viewers, that was Mr. Raymond Lada, um, a revolutionary intellectual and political economist, with us here today speaking on the turmoil in Egypt and what he believes is necessary for a true revolution to come about, both in Egypt and, like he mentioned, um, the influences from U.S. imperialism and Western influences that need to be overcome, perhaps not just by the people in Egypt, but those um, that are also under the influence and maybe even here in the U.S. Um, to change our own state of government as we influence uh, foreign countries. Thank you very much and stay tuned for more to come. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much.